folks. Uh, I'm Sam Chand in the Silverstein Chair and Dean of the Shack Institute at the uh, NYU School of Professional Studies. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today uh, for what is actually our final uh, edition of the REIT uh, Leadership Series for the fall 2020 semester. Uh, we're heading into Thanksgiving break next week and uh, uh, once we resume, whether you're a student at Shack or at any other university or college, uh, around the country. Uh, we know that you're focused on uh, your final exams and papers after that. So uh, programming uh, does start to wind down. Uh, we do have an amazing lineup uh, for the spring semester, uh, including the 25th annual uh, REIT Symposium, uh, where year after year, we're joined by over 50 different uh, REIT uh, chairmen, CEOs, and board members. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. Save the dates on your calendar. Uh, the, uh, the REIT Symposium will be uh, online for sure. If we're able to have some programming in person, then we will. Uh, but the online uh, piece of it will be there uh, uh, without, uh, without any doubt on April 6th and, and 7th. And we're introducing some really interesting new content, taking advantage of uh, the flexibility that uh, the two-day format will give us. Uh, once again, as in previous years, you know, Adam and Robin uh, will be the, the chairs of that conference. Uh, Scott and I uh, will be your hosts. Uh, please, uh, please don't miss it. Uh, this series uh, has just been amazing. For those of you who've been with us since uh, the beginning, uh, we kicked it off in uh, July with Sam Zell and have been joined by just an amazing roster uh, of CEOs and, and chairman and board members for one-on-ones. Um, uh, Hamid Mogadam, Debbie Kafaro, Sherry Rexroad, Hap Stein, uh, uh, you know, it just you name it, uh, they've, they've been part of the series. You can watch all of the replays uh, with just a couple of exceptions on our YouTube site. So in the chat feature, I'll, I'll share that link again. You know, please do uh, take advantage of that. Um, the, uh, th this is, uh, there's, there's uh, you know, this uh, REIT series on Tuesdays uh, is a partner uh, with our Capital Markets Leadership Series uh, every Thursday, uh, where we feature a CEO or, or chairman in the debt markets. This Thursday, Michael May, uh, the president of, uh, of Silverstein Capital will be joining us. After the break, uh, we'll be joined by Chris Lee from, from KKR um, and uh, by uh, Lisa Pendergast to, to round out 2020 uh, and give us a preview of, of our legislative uh, and policy priorities in Washington in, in engaging uh, in the debt markets with the new administration, what the outlook is for CMBS in 2021. Uh, we'll be joined by Lisa Pendergast, the CEO of uh, the Commercial Real Estate Finance Council. As I mentioned, both for the conference and for this series, it's really my privilege uh, to be joined by Adam Emmerich and Robin Panaka, uh, the uh, the heads, uh, the co-chairs of the REIT M&A practice at Wachtell Lipton, um, as well as uh, Scott Robinson. Uh, Scott, of course, is a, a dear friend and professor here at NYU and the director of, of our REIT Center. If you want to find out about the REIT Center, the, the, uh, the Center, Krebsy Center for Real Estate Finance, the NYU Urban Lab, which focuses on urban housing, affordability issues, inclusivity, the future of cities, uh, or our newest programs, which also include the Sustainability Center and the Young Woo Design Lab that will be kicking off in January uh, that really focuses on bringing industry students together with faculty to reimagine how we use traditional space in a post-pandemic era. So please reach out to either Scott or, or myself. We'd love to, to tell you more. Um, just a couple of brief reminders. Please use the Q&A feature to ask questions. Scott and I are gonna be paying a close uh, eye to those. You could also upvote the questions that you like. We'll come back at around 1.15 uh, Eastern time uh, to uh, put some of those questions to Jay. So please uh, ask away. Uh, I'll be dropping some notes and links uh, into the chat function. So as Jay talks about you know, some of the work that they're doing uh, at Crown Castle, uh, of course, you know, one of our own board members at Shack, also a board member uh, at Crown, Tammy Jones, joined us for the, uh, for the Capital Markets Leadership Series a, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but uh, you know, as uh, Jay is talking about the work that they're doing, sort of you know, how 5G plays into their strategy, what they're doing with ESG, uh, I'll be dropping links uh, uh, from Crown Castle's website uh, into, uh, into the chat feature. Uh, but please do use that Q&A. Put your questions in there, upvote the ones you like. Uh, Scott and I will be back in a little bit uh, to make sure that uh, we put those uh, to Jay. Uh, but without further ado, uh, I'm so excited to hear about more than 40,000 cell phone towers, more than 80,000 
uh, miles of fiber and, and all of the amazing things that, that Jay has been doing and growing this company in his over 20 year tenure uh, in various roles at uh, Crown Castle. Let me pass it off to Adam uh, and we'll see you soon. Thank you so much, Jay. Thank you so much for uh, for being with us today. As as Sam mentioned, if I'm not mistaken, you've been with uh, Crown Castle since 1999, 21 years, and you've been CEO uh, after having been CFO since uh, you've been CEO since 2016. That's been an amazing journey. I'm quite positive, given what's gone on in the in the cell phone, mobile telecommunications world. Uh, over that over that period, including you know some booms and some busts, uh, if, you know it's uh, the, you and your 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 fellow uh, cell phone tower uh, companies have become to be a huge fraction of the re uh, marketplace capitalization, and I think you know those of us who are not as technologically savvy and so forth. Uh, you know, we, we think we understand probably some of the older fashioned property types, even though they're all evolving technologically. If you could just take a couple of minutes to start off with, give us a little bit of the history of the story, the business, what you're what you're doing, where you see things going. Great. It's great to be with you. Thanks, Adam. Thanks for the introduction and uh, really enjoy having this conversation with you. So it's a privilege. Uh, we, as you mentioned, we own 40,000 towers and 80,000 route miles of fiber. Our core business, like any other REIT out, out there, is to take that infrastructure and share it across multiple customers. And we make returns by sharing it, and our customers get the benefit of lower cost because it's shared across uh, multiple players. The primary driver uh, for our revenue base is the mobile phone usage. So as we as consumers all use the devices in greater ways, it requires more equipment on our towers and more traffic across our fiber. And that's how we get paid. We get paid based on, uh, just like any other uh, REIT, we get paid based on the usage of that asset. And, uh, and the primary driver of the usage is, uh, is, uh, is cell phone traffic. Uh, data is the primary driver of that traffic. So voice uh, consumes very little traffic. Um, but data is the big driver. And I'm sure we'll get into this in a conversation, but uh, as, we, uh, as we think about 5G and where the world is headed from a 5G standpoint, there's even more growth to come uh, in, our, in our business. So there's a big tailwind uh, in, in our business that's gonna drive a lot of usage and demand for our infrastructure over the, over the coming decades. You see that, I mean, is that, I mean, we've seen this exponential increase in data and capacity and you know market cap uh, is that just continued to the sky what what what's the limit well I think there's a lot of uh, a lot of growth ahead um, 5g is is a really interesting change that's happening in the landscape if you think about what happened in wireless from 1g to 2g that basically took us from voice to a little bit of texting we went from 2g to 3g we went from uh, an ability to text to actually being able to trade some data mm -hmm. and uh, move some uh, move some things around like videos and email and some other things like that. Apologize for the background noise. It's the joy of, of doing all these things virtually uh, and uh, moving emails around. And then as we went to 4G, basically what happened was the interactions that we have with computers became almost as fast on wireless as they were when we were connected to a, mm -hmm. to a wire. What's interesting about 5G is that it opens up innovation in ways that the first 4Gs never, never did. And the reason for that, what we're used to when we talk about elev um, evolutions in technology is we typically think about them as being faster, one to two, two to three, three to four. Each of those evolutions was faster. But as we go from 4G to 5G, it's certainly faster. Uh, there's less latency in the network and there's faster speeds, which mm -hmm. improve the communications that we have. But most importantly is, is an element of 5G that reduces the scarcity of each individual slot in the network. Mm -hmm. So in 4G, each, each, uh, each tower site or broadcast point for the carriers, they could handle about 2000 users. Mm -hmm. And so we as consumers, right? You look down at your phone, you've got five bars, and you still get that spinning wheel of death. And you're like, why, why can't I get a connection? Yeah. I have five bars. So you have coverage, but in essence, all of the spaces in the network are, are being utilized. Mm -hmm. When we move from 4G to 5G, mm -hmm. 
they have an ability to handle 10,000 times more users at every location as what they could do in, in 4G. So you end up with an ability to have a million connections instead of just 2000 connections at each individual cell site. Right. So if you translate that into how do we think about that as, 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 as a real estate operator, anytime there's scarcity of, of space, it mm -hmm. drives the price, right? And the same is true for the wireless carriers. When there's only 2000 slots per tower for a user, you've got to get, they've got to get 60, $70 per slot in order to get a return on the capital that they've invested of their, their, their equipment and other things to run the network. When there can be a, a, no longer a limitation on that scarcity of space, then all the applications that are really low cost to the consumer, those, those can now be enabled devices. So mm -hmm. what that means is that the number of connections, connected devices is gonna change dramatically in a 5G world because the cost of the connection into the network is basically very, very small. And that embedded cost can now be spread across lots of devices. So we can get into this later if you wanna get into some of the things that are gonna drive that, but things like uh, people connecting uh, shoes and clothing and uh, healthcare devices and drones and, and, and cars um, and, and all of the various things, internet of things that can now be connected into the network, those are enabled because of 5G. And that creates a platform for innovation form factor is already there. The technology is already there. What the last leg of the stool uh, in, in terms of what brings the innovation is access to the network. And that's what 5G enables. So when you ask me the question about, you know, is there more growth to come? I think we've barely scratched the surface in terms of the way that we think about wireless networks being used. And I think you're gonna see a sea change unlike anything we've seen in the four, first four generations mm -hmm. of wireless really happen as we go to 5G. And that's uh, that's great for our business model. And this is like a very stupid, ignorant question, but basically you're gonna make each tower site that you're leasing to telecom service providers more valuable because so many more things are connected to it? Correct, they will need more antennas and more equipment on the towers in order to handle that uh, that that broadcast of spectrum and the consumer usage of that spectrum uh, for various things. That that's that's the direct driver of, of why it. they need more space on the towers. Got it. So let's turn maybe to the pandemic, which is of course the thing that everybody likes to talk about about it, you know its impact on everything else. You've been you know like all of us, mostly it's a, remotely managing this huge enterprise during this tremendously interesting and stressful and transformational time. What, what's the impact of the pandemic been on, on, your, on your core business? Yeah, it's been mostly uh, a driver, honestly, because people are using more wireless devices today than what they were uh, a year ago. So in many ways, it's been a driver. We've seen good growth in revenues over the course of the year, uh, increased dependency upon wireless devices, which has been largely a driver. Um, certainly from a, on a personal level, from an employee standpoint, it's been uh, as, as hard on our, our team as it has been uh, broadly ac across. And, and I, I couldn't be more proud of, of our employees, how they've navigated through these uncertain times and, and figured out ways to, to manage, the, manage the business in really unique ways. And I think there's been some great learnings from that that have been uh, in some ways helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think one of them is that Whenever you're running a large company, uh, people will, will talk about how hard it is to, to steer the tanker. Uh, and uh, the reality is, you know, we, we, we decided on, a, on about a Wednesday afternoon that we were all going to work from home after a culture of 20 plus years of saying we greatly valued being together and being in person. And mm -hmm. we had no percentage of our workforce that worked from home. And in four days, we had the entire company working from home, except for our field force. And, uh, and we've been operating that way since the middle, middle of March. And so uh, as I talked to our team, our ability to change is far faster than what we anticipated. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think as a leader being really clear about why we're making change, where we're headed, uh, it, it, it has opened up an opportunity for us to, I think, push ourselves in ways that maybe we took the excuse before of it's, we're big and we got to really study it and it takes too long to make, uh, make, make changes. Yeah. So. That's yep. been a positive. The other thing is I think COVID has killed a lot of sacred cows. And um, so in the business, we can look at it and say, 
no, there's, there's no way we can do that. And uh, I think the, uh, the amount of change that has been affected because of the pandemic has, has opened up opportunities for us to, to press into things that we probably would have said, no, that just can't be done. And uh, so it's been it's been good. It's been good uh, from a change standpoint, change management standpoint for us to press into that. Is that mostly kind of internal processes and work work structures in terms? Of I think it, it has. Yes, definitely there. And the other places, how we interact with our customers would mm -hmm. would be the same. Um, obviously, the, the networks that we all use from a wireless standpoint are dependent upon our customers operating in those networks 24 seven mm -hmm. and depending upon us being able to serve those customers 24, 24 seven. And so um, we have done, it, it has had impact everything from, from safety to the way that we work in terms of right. process interactions with the customers. And, uh, and we've navigated this together with our customers of, okay, how do we make sure we keep these networks up and running 24 seven, 365. And you know, in terms of the field force, which obviously is must be working under more stressful conditions than those of us working from home, where it just seems our devices magically continue to function like they always have. And and thanks to you, um, have, can you observe through that? You know, through the field force, sort of different conditions as they've waved through the country, or what's been the biggest challenge on that side? Well, the early challenges were putting in place safety protocols for our team. Uh, one of the places that we that is a significant portion of our fiber business is the work that we do for uh, healthcare facilities, particularly large mm -hmm. hospital systems around the country. Mm -hmm. And so we had to uh, our team had to put in place uh, some pretty pretty intensive safety protocols that uh, we had never had to consider before, uh, given mm -hmm. the environment some of our some of our folks were were going into to to do mm -hmm. some work. So the early days was around safety protocols for our, for our field teams, mm -hmm. and um, many of those are still in place uh, in in place today. Uh, the other place that has been impact, impactful is how do we navigate through. Uh, the permitting process with local municipalities. Uh, we're, we're investing uh, in the neighborhood of a uh, billion and a half dollars a year as we build additional infrastructure for mm -hmm. uh, the deployment of wireless networks. And so mm -hmm. that has a heavy impact with utilities and local municipalities. Mm -hmm. So our teams have had to work with over 700 municipalities around the country of navigating how do we get permits for, for construction activities and uh, and uh, it's been a it's been a pretty unique private public uh, partnering that has had to happen in very short periods a very short period of time in order to keep mm -hmm. the business running. Being a being a cell tower read, I suppose, is something that people didn't imagine was going to be a thing back when read legislation was first written. People didn't imagine a cell a cell phone was a thing probably at the time. Uh, <laughs> do do you? I mean. Uh, you're, as I said before, and as you know better than I do, in terms of you know the the size and the scale that you and your uh, competitor cell tower companies have have become, um, do you, do you envisage sort of other kind of new interesting frontiers for REITs that we haven't yet thought of? Different different kinds of REITs that will pop up as technology develops. Well, I think the the basic premise of a shared a shared asset. Uh, where a company can bring capital to bear uh, and buy an asset or build an asset and then share it across multiple multiple entities or customers in order to, to drive efficiencies and, and cost effectiveness. I think that business model has is intact. And, and frankly, as we think about being competitive in the world, uh, in the U.S., um, there are there are probably going to be other opportunities that that uh, that REITs can expand into. And I think it's good for the REIT industry to to, to be there. I think about the diversity that's inside of the REIT universe now, uh, benefiting from, from data centers and towers. Uh, I think that's good for, for investors to have those kind of opportunities to invest in. And, uh, and ultimately, what may have been 20 years ago kind of perceived in the tower space to be a technology risk. Mm -hmm. Today, we look at it and think, it is the leading edge of where the world is going as people do even greater activities on on mobile devices and uh, and, and uh, the remote nature of it, as well as the um, internet aspects of it, I think may create even more assets that are that are opportunities in the in the REIT space. Mm -hmm. Interesting. In terms of M um, and A, you did your you did your light tower acquisition in 2017. You've 
increased your annual growth target by 100 basis points from seven to eight. You've grown your dividend by 9% a year. That's, I've gotten the impression that's that's related to, you know, having done M&A. Do you, do you see M&A as a, as a part of your going forward strategy or in any event, how do you, how do you think about M&A? Yeah, we have, you're, you're, you're exactly right. Since 2017, we've grown the dividend a little over 9% per year. Uh, virtually all of that growth has been organic growth uh, as we've been able to lease up the assets that we acquired. The acquisition that we made at the beginning of that period of time uh, was to expand our reach into fiber, uh, which mm -hmm. is a critical component of wireless networks. And uh, we went from about 40,000 route miles of fiber to 80,000 route miles of fiber as a result of that, which enables us to install small cells. Small cells are, are similar to, uh, if you think about lighting in a room, mm -hmm. towers provide the, the overhead lights mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and small cells are like lamps where you're directing small amounts of light in specific areas. So there are ways that the carriers improve the uh, coverage of their network and uh, they need a combination of small cells and towers in order to in order to do that. So that acquisition expanded our reach uh, and uh, gave us greater opportunity for, for small cell investments. Um, on the on the go forward, we need high density, high capacity urban fiber in order to really meet our, our needs for small cells for the wireless carriers. Mm -hmm. And as we look across the landscape, we really don't see an opportunity to acquire many of those assets. We think most of what will happen from this point forward will be purpose built fiber, where we're actually putting fiber uh, into the marketplace um, as we deploy additional small cells for the wireless carrier. So um, there, there might occasionally be a small acquisition, nothing of the scale that we've done historically, because frankly, uh -huh. there, there, there aren't really any of those companies out there. I think most of it will be, uh, will be purpose-built activities. In terms of M&A, not, not for your future necessarily, but just for, for, for general purposes, like what are the what are the do's? What are the don'ts? What are the secrets? What are the mistakes people make that you've that you've learned from your from your experience in M and A? Sorry about that background. Yeah, I, I think you know if you look long term at our business model, most of our towers we acquired from the wireless carriers as they uh, moved what was a non core asset into a shareable asset on our balance sheet. Uh, and, uh, and, and so virtually all of our towers we acquired, we built some of the 40,000 towers, but most of them we acquired from the, from the wireless carriers. So they went from a single, single, single user to multi-user mm -hmm. in essence, once they were in our hands and about half of our, of our fiber assets that we acquired. And as I think back over, over those acquisitions and, and, uh, and what has happened, I think a couple of things come to mind. One is being really specific about what is our core strategy and only looking at assets that fit that, fit that core, core strategy. So if you looked across, um, I'll take fiber as, a, as an example. If you looked across all of the acquisitions of fiber companies, over the last five or six years, there has been a tremendous amount of consolidation. Some of that has occurred from companies like Azeo or private equity firms that have rolled up these, these fiber companies. And, and um, we've only done about four or five acquisitions in that space. And the reason, and there's still fiber companies that exist out there today that I say, you know, they don't meet our criteria in terms of an interest. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why we're building it. It's because we have a very specific role in the ecosystem that we're in of providing infrastructure to the wireless carriers. So if the acquisition doesn't meet that criteria, if the fiber is not there to further that goal, mm -hmm. then it's really not interesting to us, which, which means the vast majority of fiber companies that have, ever, that have ever been sold or traded really frankly didn't even get it past kind of the first leg of does this meet our strategy? Um, the same thing would be true historically for towers I and mean, towers have been bought and sold around the world. We're US focused only. And so um, uh, there have been lots of transactions that have happened in Africa and Asia, South America that we just haven't participated in because they just didn't meet our criteria. And I think over time, that diligence to a, to a strategy and a framework for evaluation uh, has, been, has been really helpful for us. I think it's kept us focused on the right market in the world and, uh, and not distracted us with acquisitions just for the pure purpose of getting, getting bigger. That would be one thing I would say. The second thing is that we believe that dividend growth is the best expect, is the best uh, predictor of shareholder value creation. Mm -hmm. And so as we think about acquisitions, 
Um, people oftentimes will ask me, does scale matter in your business? And I always think, well, scale in the dividend matters. And um, that's what we're aiming for. Like yeah. we believe dividends ought to grow and they ought to grow over the long term. So as we make investment decisions, if it's not growing the dividend long term, then it doesn't, it's not interesting to yeah. us. Uh, and if it does grow the dividend over, over a long period of time and it te- checks that first box of is it consistent with our strategy, then it becomes, then it becomes interesting to us. So um, the idea that we do things because they're quote unquote strategic, but don't drive the dividend long term, it just doesn't, it doesn't meet our, our criteria. And I think those two things over a long period of time has given us kind of a consistent approach of evaluating assets and kept mm-hmm. us on the right track uh, um, as, as we've thought about it. Got it. In terms of, um, you know, sticking to the U.S., what's, I mean, what are the pros and cons of that? You've obviously, you know, sort of uh, laid it out a little bit, but if you could talk about that a little bit more in terms of what, 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 what somehow sometimes maybe even attracts you a little bit to the idea and what, what, what convinces you to stick with the, stick with the U.S. strategy? Yeah, the U.S. is the fastest and largest growing wireless market in the world. Um, if you look at global CapEx in 2019, and it's going to be about the same, it looks like in 2020, but mm-hmm. last year, 20% of all the dollars that were spent on capital investment around uh, wireless networks were invested here in the U.S. And the U.S. only represents 5% of the world's population. Mm-hmm. So um, there are characteristics around geography, density of people, other things that make this, this market really attractive for the specific kinds of infrastructure that we own. But the primary reason why we're invested here is because of the tremendous economic returns that uh, that are available to us as an infrastructure provider. And frankly, there's nowhere else in the world that 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 opportunity exists. So you think about many of the other developed uh, places in the world, the density of population requires um, a rooftop application in order to meet the need and less opportunity for, for for macro towers. Mm-hmm. And then as we think about more developing countries, um, the amount of currency risk that exists in those markets mm-hmm. uh, and has, has been manifest over time without an in-country funding of those assets mm-hmm. uh, becomes very difficult. So we look at, you know, some of the, you could look at big markets like a Brazil or an in India where um, certainly the population and the penetration of wireless is growing dramatically and therefore there's investment in the network. But as an infrastructure provider, the day that you make the investment, you're going in at the spot rate, uh, the FX spot yeah. rate that day, and you've got to drive a long-term return against that invested U.S. dollar of capital. Mm-hmm. And uh, those markets over a long period of time, the, the foreign exchange declines have, in essence, created what we would think of in most real estate businesses as revenue churn to the right. point where it completely eroded that sort of underlying characteristic that's driven that's driven growth. Mm-hmm. So, um, and no real way to hedge the equity. You can hedge a little bit of the debt by by doing in-country debt, but no real way to, to hedge that equity component. Mm-hmm. So, the combination of lower risk, which should drive higher returns over time, and yeah. then this, uh, this very unique uh, overinvestment uh, on a percentage of population basis, we think makes the U.S. the most attractive market in the world. Interesting. Jay, let me shift gears for a minute and ask you about sort of public company stuff. There's been so much, you know, written and uh, so much investor interest in uh, ESG and corporate purpose and stakeholders. How has all of that impacted impacted you and 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 and, and the company? Yeah, you know, there's a there's a few principles that we think about in our in our culture. One one of our value statements, we have three of them, um, but one of them is uh, to be to be or think like an owner, and um, we it's through that lens of long term thinking of what would an owner do that we consider things like who else is a stakeholder in our business? How do we think about ESG matters? The reality is that or uh, diversity inclusion uh, uh, conversations. Each one of those has elements to them that when done inappropriately is really bad for business. Mm -hmm. It ultimately destroys shareholder value, erodes Mm -hmm. economic return, and limits your ability to be long-term competitive in the space that you're in. Mm -hmm. When done done appropriately, uh, it it creates the opportunity for long-term economic value, job creation, 
and, uh, and long-term shareholder, shareholder returns. Through the lens through which we think about those, those kind of topics is we think about them as we want to run a really good business for a long period of time and grow the dividend uh, grow the dividend for in perpetuity. So um, I think about just the interaction that we have at the local community level. Someone mm -hmm. might think of uh, municipalities as a stakeholder in our business. Uh, we need them for permitting. Uh, we operate in the public right-of-way space oftentimes. And so working with the local governments and citizens and neighborhoods and neighborhood associations, they have, uh, in, in, in essence, a, they're a stakeholder and they have an impact on how our business will perform long-term. Mm -hmm. So we need to make sure we handle things ethically, that we're thoughtful about safety matters and that we engage them around matters of aesthetics and other things as we're, mm -hmm. as we're deploying, deploying network. Yep. And at the end of the day, that's good for, good for business. So uh, on some level, I reject a little bit of the false dichotomy that it's gotta be either or. Uh, I, I think that if we're really generating returns for shareholders and we're thinking about long-term returns, then we got to be a good corporate citizen. Otherwise, we're not going to be sustainable as a as an enterprise and an endeavor. And uh, we spend a lot of time with our employees talking about exactly that of the framework through why do we do these things, mm -hmm. and uh, and and it's driven at the end of the day because it's good for business and it creates long-term value. So, I mean, in a way, when when I hear you talking about these kind of things, it feels like maybe these developments and the focus in the investor community haven't really changed how you as a as a long-term thinker and a long-term value creation focused company uh, do things. Do you feel, um, I mean, as you said, a false dichotomy, do you feel that this, the focus is, is justified or is it a, is it a kind of a excessive in some way? Yeah, I think it's what it what it does is it raises like like all bus, good businesses and 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 owners and operators of businesses should do. When the facts change, the decision should change, right? So we mm -hmm. should constantly be watching and learning about what matters and considering what is going to be necessary for our enterprise to be profitable and growing over a long period of time. So the, the matters of 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 all the you know the litany of things that someone could raise on these topics. There's a different list today than there was 25 years ago mm -hmm. uh, for, for big public companies. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I think in many ways it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. So those are the present set of facts in which we have. And how do we evaluate how we invest our capital and how do we operate in that environment? And at the end of the day, I view uh, the way that we do that is we correctly and, and, and appropriately evaluate the impact that we're having in the world and what is good for business, and then respond to to uh, respond appropriately to these, mm -hmm. to these matters to, to be a good corporate citizen. So, um, I, I, I again, I, I I don't think we have to run from capitalism. Uh, I think uh, you can go all the way back to to, to Adam Smith and Wealth of Nations and uh, and him articulating that at the end of the day, a good business delivers something of value to a customer, and therefore the customer wants to use. Uh, wants to use the business, right. and if if that is not true for Crown Castle today, uh, of delivering a good product at value to the wireless carriers, mm -hmm. then we won't we won't exist tomorrow. And a part of the value proposition that we have to the carriers is that lower cost shared infrastructure, which means all of the places in which Crown Castle impacts, we have to think about whether or not we're actually gonna be able to provide value to someone the next day as a result of our, uh, of our actions. So matters of ethics, matters of safety, uh, all of those come into the mix ultimately because we're trying to make sure we give a good return to shareholders. Even as companies like Crown Castle have you know, grown so rapidly to such great heights uh, over let's say since the great financial crisis, um, the number of public companies overall has declined uh, very substantially, less than half. Um, do you? What do you? Do you have, have you ever given thought to that? What's the? What's the? What's the? Why, what is that? Is that something to do with these trends, or something to do with other things altogether? Yeah, I, I'm. I'm a believer that the the number of adversities that we face in the world, uh, at just as people, has increased dramatically uh, on a on a per day basis. So you just think about uh, adverse effects that we that we event or events that we encounter on a daily basis. And yeah. that has increased the rate of change 
um, dramatically over the last 20, 25 mm -hmm. years. And I think there've been lots and lots of studies that have, have shown that. And I think part of what has happened uh, is that that rate of change has created platforms for innovation. And everywhere in the world, uh, there is a drive towards lower cost, better efficiency, and the tools that we have in front of us from technology have accelerated that, have accelerated that change. And um, that's, to me, this is what's most exciting as we go into 5G, is I think 5G is going to be another accelerant of change and innovation. And it's a platform upon which uh, new devices are going to be created, new, new uses are going to be created. And uh, I think the change we're going to see in industrial applications in wireless over the next, next decade or two decades is going to even further accelerate that, uh, the change that you're, you're referring to. And I think the manifestation, just connecting the dots, the manifestation of that ultimately at the corporate level is that companies who are winners today may not be, may not be winners yeah. tomorrow. And that, that has played itself out. Do you see that being relevant at all kind of in the short term? I mean, everybody, we're now in the second wave, I guess, and people have been speculating since the beginning of the pandemic about the check mark recovery or the V-shaped recovery or the L-shaped, the K-shaped, I don't know, W-shaped. Do you have either, uh, you know, from all your insight and obviously having lived through the great financial crisis as, as CFO, do you have any thoughts if data you're gathering uh, from the business itself that giving you insight into, into how things are going or how things might go as we look out over the next three, six, 12 months? Yeah, I'm not a, I'm not an economist, so I'll, I'll pass on, on, on predicting which letter we're going to, we're going to see in terms of economic, uh, economic recovery. But I think um, what is settling uh, as business people is you make the right decisions with the right framework and regardless of the economic uh, conditions more broadly, that's how you should operate a, operate a business. And so I think you go back to the basics of we're putting capital out and we have an expectation of return. And what are the factors in the current environment that would either improve or denigrate the opportunity for us to grow cash flows against those assets? Mm -hmm. I think just returning to that sort of basic uh, capital model of mm -hmm. deploying capital for future growth. Uh, I think that model is, mm -hmm. is intact. And um, I do believe we're going to get to the point where we have a vaccine. I also think that the fact that we've gone through this pandemic will change the way we live and work. I don't, I don't think everything's just going to go back to the way uh, it used to be. Uh, mm -hmm. I, think, uh, I think not only is Crown Castle figuring out ways to do things at lower cost, every company in America is sitting around saying, wow, we were able to operate our business, uh, or the vast majority of companies are sitting around saying, we were able to really operate our business, moving in a a significant portion of our workforce to work from home. So there are costs embedded in the network that I don't actually have to incur. Right. And, and they will make changes uh, that will change uh, lots of portions of our economy going forward. Um, but that, um, you know, that this is one of the exciting things about being a, a U.S. business and focused on the U.S. is time and again, over multiple decades, uh, our economy in the U.S. has proven its ability to be resilient and innovative, and, uh, and, and 5G is just sort of another platform for that innovation and resilience that I think you're going to see some really, really cool opportunities uh, here in the States over the, over the coming decades. In terms of things like, you know, remote working and agile working and, you know, the future of big cities like New York and San Francisco versus smaller mid-sized cities like Nashville or working from home at, you know, Big Sky or Jackson Hole or wherever it is. I mean, are you actually making bets in terms of where you're putting your infrastructure and where you're investing, where the, where the cell sites are going to be? We, we certainly think about where, where traffic is going to be a decade and two decades from now. So part of our underlying investment strategy is around you know how does how does a how does a market uh, mm -hmm. see data traffic growth over time? Uh, we tend to be even more specific though than just markets. So we're looking at uh, inside of markets. We're looking at all the way down to kind of zip code level traffics, mm -hmm. uh, traffic volume, and where do we think that traffic mm -hmm. volume is going to go? And then trying to invest our capital in places where um, most of that traffic we think mm -hmm. will occur. Um, from the investment that we're doing today, it continues to be heavily weighted towards the top 30 markets in the US. Mm -hmm. So we still believe over the next decade, two decades, the vast majority of the wireless traffic in the US is gonna be in the top 
25 to 30 markets in the US. Um, but the way that traffic uh, is incurred in those markets um, may not look exactly like the way uh, it, it, it happens. Uh, it happens today. Mm -hmm. Well, I promised to ask you a question, which we always like to ask everybody who comes on, which is, you know, we have a lot of students who are obviously under the aegis of NYU Shack. What's your advice? Someone who's, you know, you 30 years ago, coming into the workforce, interested in real estate, a tough time, future, very different from the past. What, what's your advice to, to, to our students? Yeah, I'd, I'd give two pieces of advice. One, one is um, read something that, that gives you a broad, broad view of the world. So read the Wall Street Journal, read the Financial Times, uh, read it daily, and uh, lots of concepts uh, that are talked about um, broadly outside of the sector, maybe even that you have interest in. Uh, that's going to teach you the language of business and get you interested uh, in what else is happening. And I think that practice, that discipline over a long period of time helps you see macro trends that will be really useful for you as you get to more senior level roles uh, inside of a company. And I think it's just, it's good habits. You never want to show up with a customer or a partner uh, and have something tangential to their business have occurred and you not see it. So I think that daily discipline of, of, uh, of investing and learning uh, is important. The second thing I would say is uh, from the from the first day that you walk onto the, walk onto a job, uh, you should be thinking about the decisions that are being made around you. Um, as you as you walk into the job out of school, uh, oftentimes those decisions are not going to be made by you. They're going to be made by other people. But you should go through the discipline of what if you were in the role of making the decision. And one of the things that I found uh, early in my career was I would, I would actually write down the decisions that were being made around me and I would write down what I would have done if it were my decision to make. And then I would write down what actually happened, what decision was made. And what was interesting to me over time, and I kept it in Excel and I still have this file, I, I called it things I wanna know if I'm CEO one day. And uh, one, one of the things that was interesting to me over time was it didn't take me very long to realize that I was advocating or would have made decisions that were very different than people who had a lot more experience than me. And it's, it's really started it, it, at an early age, started to open my eyes to the reality that um, the different perspectives that people have inside of a business are incredibly helpful to making good decisions. Mm -hmm. and I realized how often my decision would have been wrong because I had a narrow framework through which I was, I was thinking about things. Mm -hmm. And as I think about my role, even today as, as CEO, that diversity of, of perspective and, and input, uh, I think I cultivated that early in my career and it's helped me now be more open to listening to people who maybe adamantly disagree with me in terms of, of direction and decision because I want to hear what their perspective is because I proved myself over a long period of time. I don't always get it right. So yeah, uh, those, those are two good things for me to, they, they, help, they were helpful to me anyway. Hey, Sam, can, uh, jump on, uh, jump in with one here. And you know, some of these questions that have come in uh, by DM or, or directly on the on the Q&A um, are, are things that uh, you've mentioned, Jay, but folks are hoping you can allow uh, uh, a Zoom imperfection. The uh, Jay, uh, the um, uh, you become a REIT in, in 2014. Just uh, spend a little bit of time telling us about the decision making process, uh, why you became a REIT what the team perceived uh, the significant uh, benefits would be. And if there are, if, if it's presented any challenges for you that you didn't anticipate. Yeah, I'll do those in reverse order. So from a challenge standpoint, no, it, it really hasn't presented any, any challenges. Um, I, the, the primary reason why we converted to a REIT is obviously we saw value creation to the shareholder. That's the primary reason that, why we did it. Um, parallel to that is that I think people make better decisions when there's a scarcity of resources. And because of the amount of cash flow generation in our business, similar to most REITs, I like the idea. We, take, we pay out about 80% of the cash flow that, that we generate in the business. Uh, and obviously meeting all the REIT uh, qualifications in terms of percentage of net income, et cetera. But we could distribute far less cash flow and meet the REIT test. We actually distribute well in excess of what we need paying out about 80% of the, of the cash flow in the business. And the reason why we do that is I like the discipline of the cash flow belongs to the investor who put the capital in in order to build those assets that we, that we previously built or acquired. And to the extent that we wanna own or build more assets, 
I like the discipline of returning to investors and articulating why we think it's a good investment. And uh, we can either do that at the debt level, which we've done. Uh, we haven't used any equity over the last three years. We've talked about 2021. We think the same thing is true, that we've, we've got enough debt capacity to make investments. But whether it's in the debt markets or the equity markets, to go and articulate, this is why we think this is a good investment. I think that's very good discipline for a management team to have that scarcity of resource of distributing the cash flow to the shareholders and then articulating why we think something is a good, good investment. I, I, I just like the scarcity. So those, those, uh, those are the primary reasons and the benefits that we've seen from it. Scott? Yeah, thanks. Um, so as IoT drives your business from macro you know, cell towers to the small towers, um, it's going to drive you into, I think, a more complex ownership ecosystem, dealing with municipalities and individual building owners. Can you speak a little bit about that and, and kind of your appetite for partnerships and, and how you might continue to grow in the small tower space? Yeah, it definitely increases the, the, the challenges in, this, in, in the space, and, uh, and we've seen that in spades. Uh, and, and I think that will, that will continue. It's also, it's also a necessary component of, of wireless as the traffic increases, the need for these, uh, dense, what, what's really driving is densification. And um, there are no more spots really to build macro towers. They're, they're basically all taken. So the growth in towers is largely done. Uh, what will still grow is tenants will still add additional equipment to the existing towers. But as we increase the density uh, in order to improve the, the, the consumer experience, that density is likely to come from, likely to come from small cells. And uh, we're building most, almost all of those in the public right of way. So it, so it means there's more municipality uh, interaction than there, what, there, what there is in the tower space. It also means there's more interaction with the local community uh, as, as that infrastructure uh, gets more micro. Um, and then it also increases the interaction that we have to have with, with utilities. So there are a number of, it's both public and private and maybe even semi-public if you think about the utilities that way, enterprises that we have to engage with. And the other unique thing about, about uh, small cells relative to towers is most of the time those are deployed on a full market basis. So a carrier will come to us and they'll wanna deploy uh, thousands of sites in San Diego or in Los Angeles or uh, in Miami. The tower business is largely a one at a time basis where they come and they want to install on one tower. So the scale of the deployments is much different and therefore the scale of the interactions is, is different. And, uh, and we've, we've certainly gone through some growing pains uh, on, that, on that front. And uh, some of the comments that I made earlier to Adam around uh, the importance of, of establishing good relationships and building the right kind of relationships that are durable uh, becomes really important as we think about small cells, uh, uh, which is a little different than what it was when we were building towers years ago. Right, right. So does that mean that you're going to be uh, more focused on the municipality engagement or is it still going to be more the, um, the provider relationship, the Verizons and so on? Yeah, we have to maintain, obviously, the, the provider relationships with the wireless carriers, but the number of folks that we have doing things like government affairs at the local level uh, is, is very different uh, than, than what it was, would have looked like when we were uh, just doing towers uh, a, decade, a decade ago. Um, we operate in 700 municipalities today that we're either own fiber or small cells on, mm -hmm. and uh, um, those 700, we're constantly working with them, and they're they're obviously, they're not uniform. Uh, they have a different view of aesthetics. They have different views of how processes should work uh, and approval processes. And uh, I, in one sense, that's a challenge, right, for the business to, to manage that. But ultimately, that's the service that we provide to the carriers and why there's such a great moat around our business. So being very proficient and very good at that makes us more valuable to our, to our customers. So uh, we certainly don't bemoan the fact that we have 700 municipalities to work work through. We actually we actually view that as a as a badge of honor of you should come and work with us because we've figured out a way to operate in 700 municipalities and you don't want to go through the pain of learning to do that. So uh, I think it I think it buttresses the business and the mode around the business. You, you mentioned um, you know some of the reasons why uh, it's made sense strategically to focus on the United States and not uh, move into uh, non-U.S. markets. Are there any changes in circumstances 
uh, that might motivate you to actually make uh, an international move? I think we were always open to, to retesting our thesis and seeing whether or not it would, it would make sense. Uh, some of the characteristics that I mentioned to you when I was answering that question earlier, I'm not sure they, they, they're likely to change. So in an emerging market, uh, figuring out a way that we could remove the currency risk uh, component of that to where there wasn't really risk of erosion or churn, if you will, as a result of foreign exchange. If that factor were to go away, then yes, that would change you know, sort of one of our core reasons for, for not being interested. Um, and, and, uh, and so that, that, that could definitely uh, be something, but that would be something that would be a real structural change in the way those markets operate that would have to, have to change uh, as an example. But um, I would also say we look, right? We're paying attention to what's going on in the world and, uh, and we think about it, uh, but uh, we've gone through a lot of those processes and ultimately sort of settled back on the US is the best place to operate the business. Yeah, Adam. We've got a lot of questions about G here in the in the question and answer thing. When when is five G rollout going to be complete? Is six G already rolling out in China? What's the timetable for six, seven, and eight G? Can you give us some some G insights? <laughs> Absolutely. So five uh, G is just starting now. So we're in the top of the first inning in terms of deployments. Uh, the equipment is starting to be delivered. Was starting to be delivered kind of this summer. So. It's very, very early stages of the deployment of 5G uh, in terms of network. Um, uh, some of you may have already gotten your iPhone 12. Uh, that embedded in that iPhone 12 is the ability to uh, use millimeter wave. And um, I saw recently that Verizon indicated that about 50% of their urban traffic uh, in, a, in a decade from now, about 50% will be on that millimeter wave. Today, there's 0% of the traffic that's on that millimeter wave. So there's going to be a significant amount of network deployment that's going to have to happen over the next 10 years in order to, in order to get anywhere close to kind of that, that, that level of, of traffic on millimeter wave. And uh, that's an example of, of 5G. So I think we're probably, 5G is going to take a decade plus to deploy. Uh, we are working on 6G. We're already studying it. What's the impacts going to be? What's what are the what, what will be different about the way the networks operate? Um, but uh, we're probably that's probably beyond 2030 uh, before we start to see before we start to see 6G. What, one of the things that's uh, what, one of the things that's come up with 5G has been that while uh, it's getting a lot of attention in the consumer market right now, particularly with the, the, the launch of the iPhone and you know, one of the service providers announcing that 5G is now real. Um, on, on the other side of it, uh, I think there's a sense that you know, the, the, you know, some of the uh, really innovative applications are in the commercial and industrial space um, and, and, and not in fact sort of you know, consumer facing. What, what are folks describing to say that. Yeah, I would agree with that assessment that um, that 5G is going to change the way we think about wireless networks and, and the driver of, of network traffic is, is likely to start to see real impact from industrial applications. So ones that are commonly mentioned when, whenever this topic comes up is drones and autonomous driving. Um, I'll pick one that's not as commonly mentioned, that's an industrial use, um, maybe more real estate related. If you think of, about construction activities, one of the biggest costs of construction is either mistakes that are made in the building process or all of the processes that are in place in order to prevent a mistake uh, in the construction process. In most activities around the world where, where you're in a, in a facility and you're teaching somebody to do something or you're ensuring that they do something correctly, uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, and artificial intelligence are used in order to, pre to prevent mistakes from happening. Um, and those, those are in controlled environments where, where you can wire connect most of, most of those activities in order to ensure things happen appropriately. When you get to 5G, the response or latency of the network is sub five milliseconds. The human eye can detect things, uh, anything slower than about seven to 10 milliseconds and we can detect it with the human eye. If it's faster than that, we can't, we can't detect it with the human eye. And so today, if we have a virtual reality experience, that's 
hardware device that we put on our eyes and then the software is actually loaded there and then we're experiencing you know jumping out of a plane uh, or something else fun as we wear the as we wear the goggles around but that all of those inputs are embedded inside the software and the hardware that we're looking at and the reason for that is because the network reaction is too slow if i move my head and it doesn't move with me i'm going to start to get seasick if the network is responding at sub 10 milliseconds sub 5 milliseconds with 5g then I can't tell the difference between reality and what I'm seeing. And the network is responding so quickly that I won't be able to make that distinction. So you think about a construction activity, let's take this to kind of an industrial application. If you think about the worker on the top of a tower putting something together and he's wearing goggles and the plans are telling him there's a certain kind of bolt to put a beam together if he picks up the wrong bolt and it tells him in the instant he picks up the wrong bolt, recognizing the size of the bolt as being incorrect or off spec, you just saved an enormous amount of cost. Obviously there was a risk there, but there's no check the checker necessity becomes because it becomes real time. So from that just simple construction activity, the, the virtual reality application uh, comes into play and things like that. And there are, you know, we could talk about thousands of uses like that. Uh, the same thing is true. You can think about healthcare applications uh, to that end, car, car, all the way down to a more basic sort of a car mechanic, same, same thing. And as the cost of that, as I was making the point earlier around 5G, as the cost of that declines, if the cost declines lead to a cost savings in some other way ar around what the activity is, then all of a sudden somebody is willing to pay for that access because it reduces or eliminates another cost that otherwise would have been incurred by the business. And I think that's why you hear so many people talking about uh, how these applications in an industrial setting will be very different than, we're not just talking about watching TikTok on our phones and that's <laughs> gonna drive 5G. Uh, we're talking about real uh, uh, industrial applications that are going to eliminate costs and therefore increase adoption. Amazing. Oh, we're out of time, Adam. Can I turn it back to you? Sure. All I have to say, Jay, is thanks so much for being with us today. It was a fascinating hour. Really appreciate the time. Look forward to a new appreciation for all our devices and the networks they're on. Sam, Scott, it was great to be here all together today. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you again. Thanks very much. Thank you.